Today we have Matt Florence, who is a history student and socialist activist from Oxford in England, and he has his own YouTube channel with many good videos and interesting content that I would recommend. And first of all, Matt, um, I would like to ask you, what are your thoughts on the new United States administration? Well, to put it very simply, I think Trump is same old, same old, despite what he may have said before the election about uh, making America great again by not intervening in other countries. Um, he's continued the raids in Yemen that Obama had started. He has continued um, the United States support for Saudi Arabia in their war against Yemen. He has continued the war on Syria and even slightly escalated it by the use of Tomahawk missiles on a Syrian military base a Syrian military base, which Russians were working on, too. He's, um, it's very hard to see how Trump doesn't just represent the, the same form of republicanism that we haven't seen before with George W. Bush or others who tried their very best to cut down public spending, send America to wars abroad, and uh, promote was it Christian republicanism. So I'm struggling to find ways in which he's any different that isn't just talk. Um, he did induce the travel ban, but they've been, there's been uh, immigration ban to the United States dotted full throughout its history. Uh, Obama himself has deported more undocumented immigrants to the United States than any other president uh, in the history of the United States. So what Donald Trump is doing is fighting against immigration is no different from the predecessors. Um, you know, endless war, mass spying on allies posturing and shoving your chest in the face of a rival, rival superpowers such as China and Russia. Nothing Trump is doing is new, but in my opinion, anyway. And what are your thoughts on Kurdistan and its actions in relation to the ongoing conflict, um, which is a Wahhabi war prosecution? against Syria. Oh, I agree, yes. Um, I'm very glad that the Kurds found a way to exploit the uh, contradiction with imperialism to actually get the United States to fund them and arm them. There are different factions of the Kurds, of course. They're not one autonomous body that thinks the same. There are different factions and political wings of the Kurds. The Kurds are an ethnic group minority, not a political group. But uh, when it comes to Kurdish militias, I think it's ingenious how they found a way to trick the United States into funding and supporting a leftist group um, without having to dedicate yourself to fighting against the Syrian government. Maybe the United States will push the Kurds to fight against the Syrian government in the future. How many of the Kurds would actually go along with that, we don't know. But um, I think people really underestimate the need for modern military equipment in a war such as Syria. There's, um, you know, some, uh, how, how do I put this? I was reading a book um, on modern snipers by a man called Lee Nettle. And uh, I was really surprised at the training and the equipment it takes for a sniper. There's no such thing as an insurgent sniper. You can't just pick up a rifle. It takes years of training and tens of thousands of uh, pounds worth of equipment to do so. It's just not practical to expect the Kurds to be able to defeat a modernized, almost modernized, they don't have jets yet. Uh, they don't have jets in a Navy yet, but, all, you know, a standing army like ISIS on guerrilla tactics alone. You know, uh, in the words of military genius Mao Zedong, I know I'm not pronouncing that correctly for some people who want to put that out there, but that is the way that the English pronounce it. Um, in the words of Mao Zedong, guerrilla warfare is not the end goal. It is a step towards building a standing army. So uh, I hope very soon we'll see the Kurds with a standing army if they continue to exploit the resources the United States are giving them. If, however, the United States decides that they want to use the Kurds against the Syrians, I, um, either their attempts will be a disaster or I doubt that many Kurds would actually go through with it. Because, after all, it's the Kurds who are stuck with the mess 
of a war that the United States are pushing them into. So it's not within their interest to start picking fights with the Syrian government. Also, At least the majority of Kurds, anyway. I think also, that they would be... Sorry, sorry. Go, go, go ahead. No, no, go on, I'm finished. I, I was going to say, I don't think it would help the Kurdish provinces with a Wahhabi-controlled state or territory to their south. I oh, don't... of course, I agree. Um, if the Syrian government falls, it would be a disaster for Kurdish people because the only people left to fill that power vacuum are groups like ISIS and um, Al-Qaeda and other you know, un various unsavory groups. That would be far worse for the Kurds than any secular Syrian government would. Also, do you think Wahhabi terrorism in Syria and Lebanon as adversely affects Palestine? Uh, well, it puts in extremist elements into Palestine, which makes it harder for the Palestinians to organize against Israel. So, uh, yes, I do. Um, well, we, you know, we've seen um, recently uh, the Israeli military admitted that ISIS had apologized for shooting at their soldiers. Why ISIS isn't fighting against Israel is very bizarre, because we're usually given this uh, idea that all of the Islamic fundamentalist groups in the Middle East are all ganging up in Israel simultaneously, and there's just like um, the secularish Jewish state side versus all the Muslims, which just isn't true. Um, there's, you know, there's a very clear difference between groups such as Fatah and um, Fatah, sorry, and other Palestinian groups compared to ISIS and Al Qaeda which don't, which um, ISIS and Al-Qaeda, on the other hand, which don't like to make deals or sacrifices or negotiations with anyone. Also, um, another thing, it wasn't widely reported in the Western media, um, that ISIS apology, I noticed. Yeah, I only saw it on Russian Today. I thought it was hilarious. Um, I always saw these memes, but they were usually just like conspiracy theory rubbish. They're like, why doesn't ISIS attack Israel? And um, now I'm really asking the question, why isn't ISIS attacking Israel? It's kind of took a couple of years to sink in. But the source of this story was a Likud defense minister. They, it doesn't come much more straight from the horse's mouth than that. <laughs> yeah, of course. Also, while we're on the subject of imperialism, um, what do you think of the hawkish rhetoric coming from America on the Democratic People's Republic of Korea? Again, like almost everything in the Trump administration, it's same old, same old. The United States has been trying to topple the North Korean government for over 60 years. So what Trump is saying, we need to teach them a lesson. It's same as every other U.S. president, you know, inviting wealthy financial ministers into your cabinet, mass spying, uh, hawkish rhetoric and bombing other countries. Like we said, Trump is no different from any other of the United States presidents. I'm sure some of his very hardcore diehard bands are very upset that he tried to bomb Syria because they actually believe what he said about uh, making America great again by keeping American soldiers in America, but that, that's, that's not going to happen by electing one single man. The United States has, uh, I, can't, I can't remember the exact name, but I know for a fact that it's over 400 different foreign military bases scattered across the globe. How is Donald Trump going to deconstruct and bring back every single one of them? In the United States, its economy relies on how much it can, how much you can salvage from the countries it's destroyed. So a country like Libya that wants to keep their oil reserves themselves, that can't do. We're going to have to destroy them like we did in 2011. Um, Iraq, we use the excuse of WMDs and humanitarian, you know, humanitarian intervention, as they call it. Imperialism now has to hide its motives. It has to call itself humanitarian and it's doing all these lovely things. But look at the results. Um, I think it was a uh, military expert, David McCullen, uh, may not be pronouncing his name correctly. I apologize. David McCullen. 
um, who was the author of Out of the Mountains, which was a book on the, um, actually, I'll get back to who he is later, but what's important is his quote in which he said that the United States hasn't directly founded ISIS, but has indirectly, sorry, indirectly contributed to the founding of ISIS by toppling the Iraqi government and then leaving a power vacuum for jihadi groups such as ISIS. And just a couple of things there. Um, Sorry, I got really off track there. We were talking about North but, Korea, weren't we? Yeah, but it, it it's all the same hegemonic um, imperialism and basically um, Bush and Blair knew that the Iraq had destroyed their weapons of mass destruction program and that's probably ISIS, why they invaded ISIS, yeah. probably no defense no deterrent they i can't but, imagine them invading north korea while north korea has atomic uh, missiles yes um at least 48 i believe if i'm getting my figure 40, correct, sorry? 48 um warheads I believe, if I'm getting my figure correct. Who has 48? Korea. Oh, well, uh, I don't know. But in any case, um, ISIS you were talking about, they were under Saddam's reign. They were a small Wahhabi group, which which couldn't do the damage that they do today. Let's be fr frank about it. Hussein had them under control. But Basically, they were able to exploit Clinton's containment mm -hmm. for um, basically propaganda purposes. Under Bush, they became a bigger group and joined part of the Al-Qaeda coalition. And then they became ISIS um, towards the end of Bush's presidency and going into Obama's. But basically, they have been... A, around for a long time but it's only within the last decade or so they have became something stronger and you're right to point out the deterrent and national defense and security to link it in with korea and iraq iraq got rid of their um deterrent they got invaded korea kept theirs and they haven't despite all the rhetoric yeah also, and again, it's sure, another... This, all this talk that the United States gives about getting countries to uh, de-arm their atomic weapons and their missile programs, it's really just pressure to try to get them to expose their bellies, to make it easier to invade them. So when they say yeah. to North Korea, you know, oh, come on, get rid of your uh, missile testing, it'll be fine. They don't... Um, they're not really they don't really mean that they're trying to pressure north korea into giving up their missiles so that the united states can more easily invade them in the future um the north korean government sent a proposal to the united states saying that if if you give up your annual war games in south korea in which you simulate invading north korea if you give up those simulations we will give up our nuclear weapons program and the united states refused now, why would they do that? They say that they want North Korea to give up their atomic weapons for peace, but um, the United States practices every single year simulating invading and killing North Koreans in their South Korean war games. Uh, if they're not going to invade North Korea, then why do they need that? Oh, basically, the warheads, as you said, are an excuse, and it's just so they they want a war basically and there is the fact that you said humanitarian intervention li liberal interventionism it's an all weasel words for militaristic neoconservatism but as you said they offered the warheads if it was about the warheads why didn't they accept the offer and stop their war games but of course the arms industry doesn't want to miss out on the cash cow and the golden goose of another korean war not only the arms industry all major corporations in the united states 
are benefiting from the United States military actions abroad. If you are a computing company, you benefit when the United States conquers and submits a country that has mineral resources when you, that you need. If you are Kellogg's, you benefit when the United States dominates the government of a small third world country that can give you the labor and the agricultural resources that you need. If you are a, um, an intelligence company or an arms company or a weapons country or company, a vehicles company, uh, you know, even a you know, labor resource management company, then you will greatly benefit from the United States military and its actions abroad. Because even when you're not selling them things, when the American soldiers go to a country such as Iraq, they slaughter and wipe out any resistance the Iraqi people put forward, um, control their oil fields, and then you know, suspiciously start selling that oil super cheap to American companies. All American companies in the United States profit because they are you know, hoarding up that cheap, juicy energy resources that the United States has just secured from a country that they've conquered. Uh, I can only imagine what would happen if they invaded North Korea and wiped out any resistance there. I don't think that will happen as long as North Korea has their atomic bombs and as long as they stay as strong as they are. But the, you know, the, um, you're not only the uh, energy resources, but the strategic location of the country makes it easier to invade another country and grab even more resources for the bourgeoisie of the United States. So if they invaded North Korea, they would only have mineral rights. They would have access to the intellectual capability of the people there, educated, and the workforce there. And they would also have one of the most strategic locations in the world and would help them, give them a big stool to stand on when threatening Russia and China. Which, um, not only in a direct invasion, but having that threat there also helps the United States get their way in UN resolutions. On the Security Council, I assume you're talking about um, uh, any any action of the United of the United Nations, because if you are, are the United States and you can threaten China and Russia, and they are in a vulnerable position, then any action they want to put forward in the United Nations, they will think twice. So, how what would the United States think about this? Would this put us in conflict with the United States? Can we can we stand up for Palestine, or would the United States threaten us and sabotage us for that? So it puts these countries like Russia and China in a very difficult position just by having American military bases around them. Indeed. And what is your analysis of the post-Maidan Banderite war on Ukraine and Donbass? When you say Banderite, you mean the specific version of Ukrainian fascism, which is what people call Banderism or the Banderites, I guess you could say. Ukrainian nationalism. Well, I was thinking more... After of Seven the, Bandera. Yeah, the overt fascists and national socialists. You don't have to look Kiev. hard to find it in Ukraine. And you only have to in look the as... Kiev regime. Yeah. Um, in 2014, the fascist coup took forward in Ukraine. Sadly, I'm sure there were many people the streets who actually wanted to end government corruption which did exist and was prevalent in ukraine uh, sadly the only one well not the only ones but the most militant and the most hardly armed and the ones with foreign backing were fascists and i don't say fascists as in oh i'm a lefty you disagree or something you're a fascist i mean fascist as in swastikas heil hitler let's go kill some jews kind of fascist the, you know the real kind that you saw in Jew Germany is alive in today in Ukraine. Um, you know, as I said, you could just Google Azov Battalion. They started out as a paramilitary fascist organization. They wear the Wolf's Ankle, which is a German SS symbol. Shoot Staffel symbol, isn't it? Uh, the, On their flag. Um, I know about the Wolf's Angle. Uh, yeah, the, the SS symbol? Yes, it was an SS symbol used by German SS divisions invading the Soviet Union. So they used these SS symbols um, used by Germany to invade Russia, and they're using it in a war which is primarily against ethnic Russians who uh, population who lives in eastern Ukraine. So if, you know, if there's a race riot in Great Britain or the United States, you don't start wearing clan hoods, do you? Because that pretty much exposes your racism, doesn't it? So, it yeah, 
<laughs> if you're an Eastern European and you're wearing Nazi SS uniforms and fight against Russians, that's, that's the just only conclusion. Yeah, that's just the equivalent that's of an enough. American person wearing um, clan hoods going to fight black people. It's that overt of racism. Um, there are other... May I just get up uh, some of my notes? Because I did write this in preparation, and I wrote an article on the about the uh, about the rise of fascism. In early 2014, there was a coup in Ukraine in which the then Russian allied Ukrainian government was overthrown by Ukrainian nationalists. During the coup, the secretary of the Ukrainian National Security and Defense Council, in charge of the Ukrainian armed forces, was a man called Andriy Perubi, who was the founder of the now dissolved neo-Nazi party called the Social National Party of Ukraine. So they put a real, open and proud neo-Nazi in charge of their armed forces. And working alongside Perubi was a man called Yarosh, who was the leader, now former leader, of far-right nationalist paramilitary right sector, or sometimes called Pravi sector. Uh, after the coup, was a man called Alexander Sitch became the deputy prime minister of Ukraine. Now, Sitch belongs to a nationalist party called Soboda, which believed that Russia is controlled by a so-called Muscovite Jewish mafia. Soboda was a remaking of the Ukraine's the, the neo-Nazi party, the Social National Party. So the Social National Party, Ukraine's neo-Nazi party, dissolved and gave, gave way to Soboda, which um, you know, now controls the deputy prime minister chair of Ukraine. I believe that Alexander Sinch has is, is not in the position anymore. Um, it was at the uh, time of this article being, oh, at the time of the beginning of the Maidan. But uh, you know that just shows just how prevalent neo-Nazis are in the Ukrainian government, that they've managed to snag the prime minister's, sorry, the deputy prime minister's chair, uh, the um, paramilitaries that have sided with the Ukrainian government, and the head of the armed forces of Ukraine. So anybody, anybody who says that neo-Nazism is not prevalent in Ukraine is completely blind to what is going on. Also, you mentioned that they are violently anti-Russian and there have been incidents of ethnic cleansing. When I say that these fascist Russians paramilitaries in hate Russia, Don, Don, I'm sorry? Donbass, um, the, there have been incidents of violent ethnic cleansing of Russians in the Donbass by Kiev-backed militaries and the, these gangs have also attacked Jews and synagogues in Ukraine as well. So, as you say, it is clear that they are Nazis and nobody can... Strangely die. enough, they haven't attacked synagogues as much as you'd think in a country that has neo-Nazi paramilitaries wandering about. It's not, not usually that overt as in attacking a synagogue, but there is military violence against Jewish people. It's just not all around the board as it was in Nazi Germany. They seem to be directing most of their hatred towards the ethnic Russians and racial discrimination against them. I mean, uh, during the uh, beginning of the Maidan, you even had a few Jewish leaders even stand up and support the Maidan and, you know, say, oh, there, there's no violence against us whatsoever. But I do find it incredibly hard to believe that a country whose government uses neo-Nazi uh, militias to kill its opponents that country is not a country which is safe for Jews. So um, there is a lack of reporting on it, and it's quite hard to find any instances of mass violence against Jews, but it must be there, because otherwise they wouldn't exist, these, these paramilitaries. Oh, there, there, there have been arson attacks on synagogues, which have been reported, although not as widely okay. as it ought to have been. But however, when you're an ally of Israel, it's very bizarre, isn't it? Semitism and violence. It's it's Israel is allying it's itself it's with a country right. that uses open neo Nazi terrorists with SS symbols on their uniforms and praise Hitler. Uh, this is a country that Israel wants to bargain and be friends with. It's sickening, really. And, you know, we, I've said this time and time and time and time again. Not all Jews support Israel. Not all Christians support the United States. And not all Muslims support Saudi Arabia. 
indeed. And okay. Um, well, thank you very much, Matt. And I hope at some point in the mm -hmm. future we yeah, will it was be speaking nice to meet you too, and uh, I hope your channel grows too. Any... Yeah, it was nice to meet you too, and uh, I hope your channel grows too. Thank you very much.